Shall we start? Sure. So, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mary Sabatino from Gallery La Long, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar with Kate Shepard, who has an exhibition on view at our gallery, Surveillance, that had the pleasure and the pain of opening in mid-March and closing for the shutdown, though we've reopened um, for the last five or six weeks, and happy to welcome visitors physically in the space. Um, Kate is uh, an amazing painter, rigorous in every way, deeply spiritual, deeply thoughtful, and how light and color are, I would say, mysteries, active mysteries, is something that has been concerning and obsessing her for 20 years. And our talk today will trace the development of what uh, people find new in this body of work, but which she has been exploring for nearly 20 years. And Kate and I actually know each other for more than 20 years of the hot day like today, like this day in July that I first visited your sixth floor studio on the Lower East Side. Uh, a day that I remember, and I'm grateful to have been working with you this long, Kate. So thank you, um, and thank you also for interrupting your time away from New York to share your work and to share your thoughts with um, everyone who is tuning in today. So let's look at the first image. Um, can we have the first image? So Kate, um, you began uh, this talk, which you structured very beautifully with an image from nature, an image that you took um, quite recently, uh, as I see on the North Fork where you are now. Um, can you talk about why you chose this image to begin the talk? Sure. Um, for starters, it's summertime, and I think we should we can stay true to the time of year and um, I have been suppressing a layer of perception in these paintings, and I think this show finally addresses it. Um, and I've always been obsessed with ponds because there are so many layers that your eye, the retina of your eye, need to readjust to, like up, it's the, the top of the water reflects the sky, and then the water itself has a texture like ripples or whatever it has, or waves. And then there's the foliage above, and then the reflection of the foliage. And then there's underneath the pond where you look at the mud and the fish. So what I notice is that every time I look at different layers, my actual physical eye has to change, open and close to readjust to those layers. And I think that has everything to do not only with our physical eye with my paintings but also in how we just take in the information and uh, judge it or enjoy it or ingest it and what I've noticed in my paintings is that I've only been considering one layer and this this show really addresses the most uh, glaring layer no pun intended that I have been ignoring for years well, I don't know if you've been ignoring it, but that everything you said, I think we could unpack for a long time. So the, the next image that you chose, your, which it, it comes, I mean, 1999, so that's a little around the time we started working together, maybe a couple of years earlier. And, and here, the light is inside the space and you're engaging with architecture which is also part of your, your formation, right? Right, yeah, I did study architecture and classical painting. And I, this is, this is cements me using household paint as the only kind of paint that I use. And so far away is a direct measurement of the outer door. And I'm sort of pretending that light is shooting through these doorways onto the far, it's a, fict it's a fictitious type of arrangement, but there's some truthfulness in that I copied the dimensions and then the paint on the far wall is shiny white, whitish 
cool light so that it can play a part of that story. It, it's a fiction that seems uh, that seems realer than real. Um, <laughs> and then you were also playing with architecture um, uh, here at a show you did at our gallery in, in Paris. This is a very French image, I think. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, pay an homage to the decorative element of the banister, that Art Deco, beautiful metal design, but use a completely different reference, but just as ornate. So I painted the walls very carefully in two different colors so that, and this is the study for it, so that it, it would simulate light coming from the window onto the wall with a fictitious reality of what that window is because it's a blank window. So um, there's a beautiful chemistry between the two colors. Obviously one is shiny and the other one is matte. So it really gives that illusion of light. So this is the Lower East Side studio. Wait, can we, um, so, and here, was this a test for what you yeah. did in Paris? So this came for Paris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the Lower East Side studio. Um, this was your show, Wall Floor, Rocky Crag, which we did in 2006. And even when I look at it, I think that the light, sorry, Kate. I forgot what year, sorry. <laughs> 2006. Um, and the light is on the wall, or is the light on the wall? Yeah, no, the light is simulated in that the wallpaper that I painted on the left is violet over black, and on the far wall, it's black over violet. So I'm deceiving the viewer to see that maybe there's a different amount of light on one wall than the other. Um, but I've done a lot of wall paintings. This is quite a leap but mm -hmm. uh, from the other images, but it's, I like how musty and depressed and ornate and beautiful and it's like background noise, but it's also like really complicated. Exactly. So when we did our rehearsal yesterday, I was surprised that you said, um, that you use this painting as a kind of reference for what is going on in the show now. Though, of course, once you explained it, it was totally clear that this is also about how light moves and the reflections. Yeah, maybe you... exactly. This, this doesn't relate to the current show, but it's the same interest in that I'm, I'm creating the fiction of light being on on the left side and off on the right side and trying to find a balance in the chroma and the values so that, so that the eye believes those, that reality. Um, and this, when you, remember when you sent this painting to the gallery and it was the empty. Yeah, this is that apartment that you climbed up six floors for in that um, when I sent you all the work for that show and the studio was Bear, I needed to make one last painting in order to reflect what that spare, spare studio had. Rather than being depressed that everything was gone, I was kind of celebrating the emptiness, which I always love to do in a painting is to make something feel full, present, but empty at the same time. And I called it I, I, leaf greens, like mm -hmm. a light new leaf mm -hmm. because it was not a death, but a beginning of a new chapter of the painting. Also, I love that this painting has a diptych. That's a true uh, interval. You know, it, 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 it you, you, you see the space between as well. And that's something you've done a lot. You said that, Mary. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the reason I had those spaces, and I had to remember this recently, is that I constantly want the, I want the eye to have a job to do. Mm. And it does, it does. Also, it's, it's almost the other thing about this painting when I was thinking about it last night is that it's a little bit of inviting us into a room as if the room is a stage. Yes, yes, exactly. That's really, really well said and if I can just talk in a sort of technical nerdy way, the reason that the 
panel's job like that and that there's four colors is that I want you to enjoy the panel itself and also go into the space. And since we photographed it professionally, you don't see the reflection because like I said with the pond, I was really oblivious to that as an important element. So the next slide shows- Here we you. are. <laughs> reflection <laughs> city, I said reflection city. Exactly, so while we always, we found always the best photographers to eliminate the reflection, I took this in my studio as well as some others because I always keep a record of a painting. And, and while I didn't acknowledge it, the room completes another narrative of what the painting is doing. And here it's interesting because that trapezoid, that big mother trapezoid is a, is a, is a depiction of a painting itself. And I kind of thought about it as the, in, um, uh, the Nutcracker Suite. Um, I think her, I forgot the name of the, the big skirt where the poly Chanel's come in, but I think of that big rectangle, which represents a painting itself as letting go of all the images in the, on, that would have been on the surface as like, as like spewing them out like those children. And, and that show, that was the debris show, right? Right. Debris meaning like things were falling apart. The painting was disgorging. This is just another example of how the room is creating more space than that figure is creating. But the figure always does create a space, but then the room makes it deeper. Again, I'm always keeping a record of paintings in process and thinking that those things are a pest. But then with this painting, I thought, oh, let's just go for it. And this was at the gallery, I think. And I, somebody took a, some sort of picture and I mimicked, I just took this as a dare. So I mimicked what the painting was doing. You, you, you mimicked it as a, as a dare, um, but I'm just gonna interrupt slightly. Somebody just asked a question. What is the size? Um, this painting, I think, was 72 by 48, um, 6 by 4, which is a kind of physical size. Exactly. Yeah, um, it's important in this period of work that it be, represent a body, a door, uh, that you have an, a very direct to it. I, every proportion panel is uh, an invitation for a different subject matter and I can't intersperse them. This, this show also, we had a lot of figures in it and yeah. people were a bit taken aback. This is yeah. a reference um, also to architecture. You were really, I mean, though I know you've always been a lover and, uh, um, of architecture, this show had a lot of Mies van der Rohe references um, yeah, this and this here in the back of the Barcelona Pavilion, she's mm -hmm. alone and she's very graceful. She's making this pose, um, which is, I found very mysterious. So while I trace this figure from a game figure that is like, I think you called them avatars that were mm -hmm. from computer games. I um, I always felt like that there, there was a classical reference that would pop out of this common, you know, like uh, contemporary culture, and then she'd always turn into a classical figure. I, I, you can't get more contemporary than an avatar, <laughs> um, and so, but it is a very classical, almost you know, you know, Hel Hellenic. Uh, figure and I think that's what's so interesting Kate that you have this quite classical training and yet you use the most up-to-date technology to make the images with um, as you were just saying uh, using the avatar. Uh, friends of mine from the Academy said that we always had our teachers on our shoulders and it took years maybe like eight years to get them off so I think that they're off, but I'm enjoying them again. <laughs> uh, this painting, uh, this photograph just shows you where the whole turning point happened with me. I think in two th end of 2016, um, I had just been at the Chinati Foundation helping with the Bridget Riley mural, and I had a bigger break from my studio than I ever had, and I put up the paintings that I was working on, and 
invited people over and the first thing they asked about was the reflection. And at a certain point, my standard spiel was no longer really holding a candle to the strength of this obvious element. So I decided to figure out how to make paintings of the reflections themselves. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to render them like a, like a classical painter. So I had to figure out how to do that. And so I took a painting that was blank and shiny and put it at the door of my studio and it reflected the studio. Um, so this is basically a reflection of my studio, which I screen printed back on to the panel, which had originally seen that reflection. And I captured that moment in time of what that panel was doing in the studio. And the chair is Patrick Callery's chair, which he magically mm. gave me. And I posed it there as like a surrogate figure. It feels like a portrait to me. If you took that chair out, it would just look like mishmash. It, it feels like it has a beautiful presence, like what you said earlier about a stage. It feels that way. Yes, the, the legs are quite important um, in, this, in this painting. And they're the curve as well in the, um, I see a kind of somewhat a twin, even with the Barcelona figure, a grace that, that comes into the painting. Yeah, to animate it, to give it a sense of breath. Mm -hmm. So um, the the image we deleted last night, and yeah. it, it it you know sort of it's haunting me here was the Vermeer of the woman pouring water by the window, um, which um, we I thought might be unusual to have in the in the presentation, but now I miss it. Because here's 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 the the light in the window, which is something, whether it was in the one you did in Paris, the test, the light from the side is something that occurs and reoccurs in so many of your paintings, Kate. Yeah, and stronger in some of the other ones that we're going to show. And the beautiful part about the light is that it creates another plane, whereas these are directly facing the windows. And what I remember about this is that I eliminated the middle window so that the two windows looked like eyes looking at you and there was more of a, an, a, an emotional, almost anthropomorphic quality about the painting. And it's yellow, so in one iteration of the title I used the word cheese and then I got afraid that it would turn people off, so I changed the title. Yellow, it's not an easy color to work with. We have a yellow painting in the show, which yes. we can talk about the title later. I would love to. Um, this is a selfie painting. I never put my own figure in the painting, but I noticed that it was abstract enough seeing myself take a picture of the panel with my phone. So, you know, we're all taking selfies and this is the degree to which I'm gonna take a selfie. Um, and what's beautiful about this painting, which I think we're gonna show in the next slide, is that when the painting is in the show, and then when people go to see the show and take photographs of the painting, they become part of that scene. I don't know if we, we kept that in. We do, um, we, have it, we have it next, but I just wanted to let everyone know that this is an installation photograph at the gallery. Uh, and this is the small gallery, and you can see how the physical scale of the paintings is working in the space, which is something that's really important to Kate. So we can go to the next slide, and you can see selfies in selfie. Yes, like so that's Barbara Ta Takanagua took that picture. I know I just messed up her name, but this reminds me of the beautiful relationship not that I'm, you know, an old master, but it reminds me of Las Meninas because the figure on the right side who is taking the photograph is becomes the role of the painter looking at the viewer, which is us, and then all the reflections become like the coterie and the dog and the dwarf looking and the princess looking at us. So I love all those references and of course the mirror in the far back. It's one of my favorite paintings and I will take any opportunity to 
make reference to it because it's complicated in terms of layering and perception and who's looking and who's being reflected. And do you th and what's amazing, beautifully said, Kate, is right now we're all in a period of looking, right? The, the shutdown, the pandemic was one kind of looking and all the um, reawakening and reorienting of contemporary life is another kind of looking right now. So like always, you're ahead, you, you, you are intuiting what is about to come. As so many I have to good say, artists I mean, do. when we closed the, the gallery, like the day after the show opened or so, I felt such a sense of peace that these paintings were doing exactly what they were meant to be doing, is just reflecting the room. And oddly enough, while I was sad that a lot of my friends and peers couldn't see the show, I, I knew that the paintings were, like I said, doing what they were meant to do. Yes, it was a tough time. So this painting, um, which is in the Phillips collection, um, has the, the reflection of the, the window in it. Yeah, that's the, again, this is just a working picture of me mm -hmm. making something in the studio and not really noticing that window. Now I do, I see that it creates a completely different space than the curtain of tiles that's active on the surface. That's the line work. And um, this is my favorite wall to hang a painting on. So every time I hang a painting on that wall, I'm gonna get that north light kind of window. Um, and then I decided to really acknowledge that window. So the next slide shows you that rather than doing that lace work with lines, I put a different kind of surface on the blank panel, which was in this case, a soapy surface. And then I hung it in that favorite place which captured the window. And so uh, the painting is doing what the line work had been doing. Um, so you have the surface of the panel and then you have a reflection of a plane going back from a different source, from the source of the window. Um, and the car wash, uh, was that a kind of pun or? Yeah. Yeah, it's like when you're in a car and you're seeing the windshield and it's like you feel almost blinded by all the soap. So it felt like an obvious reference and the soap is, it has a sense of gravity. So I'm catching that gravity. Unfortunately, this was a hard painting to make because the soap started making hearts and penises and whatever. And you have to sort of use the image that has the least recognizable shapes. <laughs> Sorry, I hope that wasn't too graphic. Now, um, Kate, would you be able, because we're going to go into, I think, a very important part of the talk, but to just briefly tell people how you make the paintings? Sure, they're made with Please. panels that I design very specifically for the subject matter, and I shellac them and gesso them, and then I put at least four coats of Dutch enamel paint on them. And if I don't get the painting right, I will continue to sand it down. I sand in between layers, which is an important aspect of this show, actually. It's essential. And then, you know, some of these paintings I have been working on for 14 years. I just haven't gotten that image right. So it's like painting a boat or a, a door. It's, it's, it's an available surface forever, unlike canvas. If you treat it right, you can just keep using it, like Blackboard. And, the, and there's like this painting, painting I wanted to show. Mary, can mm -hmm. I tell why yeah. I want to show this? Mm -hmm. Because again, like these lights were so interfering in such a violent way. And I realized this was maybe the a painting I did for the show, but decided not to keep it because I wanted the line work to be absent in this show. I wanted the paintings to do what the line work does, which is go mm -hmm. back in space in a plane. I wanted it to do it with different uh, materials. So what I noticed was that inherent in these lines of fluorescent lights is a one point perspective diagram. I think the next slide, oh, th this is yet another one where the, you've got this delicate line work that is, you know, really 
uh, considered very carefully, and then boom, you get this like interrupting cow, as we say in our family, like from that knock knock joke. And so the next slide, I think, is just shows you the quintessential um, one point perspective diagram that is just so simple. And um, obviously, if we put that on this, flip that and put that on the ceiling, it would be here's a here's a also a quintessential diagram so that you see that there's a vanishing point and you see that the horizontal lines get tighter and tighter towards the back, even though there's a variegation here. And so I felt really confident using this, using this element that's always been a hindrance to me as the painting. It was a, it was a really fun kind of like, I, I felt like I found something in my pocket that had been there all along. Uh, and here, now, when you explained the diagram and everything last night, it was quite clear. And now, of course, every time I see this paint, as soon as I walked in this morning, I said, thought, one point perspective. Um, but it's quite interesting, Kate, again, I mean, going back to using an avatar, a classical figure, the way you're using the the building blocks of what is essentially painting, classical drawing, the art history of, you know, centuries ago, and reimagining it in an almost, you know, using almost a photographic means to say, we're talking about now, and we're talking about today's reality. I find that that contrast so there has always been this weaving of different criteria. So you got it right. My um, one of the criteria I have, and in fact, I got so confused doing this show and that I made a, a Venn diagram of the things that I feel are necessary in every painting. And one of the necessary things is to, to create some sort of space so that you have the surface of the painting doing one thing and then you have you can go inside that place and i can talk about the other venn diagram things in a different talk i'd love to see the venn diagram i wish i knew about it it would be great to see to see it um, oh this is called oh not groove but this is called grove because i thought how am i going to get away with those two colors they are different temperatures they're they don't really belong together so i thought about bryce Martin's Grove series and when I was off and running. And sometimes in the title, it's my way of giving myself an excuse to do something I feel vulnerable about. Does the title come after, before, or during? It's usually a working title, but then it's after, which is like pins and needles. So, so that painting, that violet painting is another one point perspective, but I turn the lights off. And this is essential to the title of the show because I thought about like, what is an office building or a studio look like when nobody's there? And so you sort of, you kind of imagine a, a, the surveillance of, of a guard looking on a camera to make sure there's nothing going on. Like, and I also thought obviously about Bruce Nauman's piece, which is, you know, more brilliant than anything, but um, so in any case, we've got the space, we have pink underneath, which is a completely new technique of working so that you have this layering of transparent color over pink that makes this color. And I like the spookiness, the loneliness, the scariness, but yet the beauty of this painting. And so that was part of the Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, last night you said that these paintings had to be born and that you wanted something spooky about them but it, you didn't set out for that right you didn't you it it developed organically i think i always wanted something spooky in the paintings and later on in the talk we will find one that is not spooky so i had to title it in a way that acknowledged that it wasn't spooky so uh, this is the um, gallery right now today uh, with um, with the show and actually so we're going to talk next actually we're going to talk about a painting next that's not in the show um, which 
uh, I love the title. Yeah, this is the television painting. It's, you know, obviously Albers is in this painting, a hard boiled egg is in this painting, and a television is in this painting, and it's a combination of the sanded and reflective surface. And then the, when I took a picture just to record it, you get that, fl the fluorescent lights, which make an antenna. Obviously, everywhere this painting is gonna go, it's gonna make its own narrative, but I thought this was kind of amusing, so we left it in the, sh in the slide talk. So, and then the next one shows how I am translating the printed imagery and not printing anymore so that the shapes on the panel, which are my regular paint over what is the sanded layer, mm -hmm. will create um, a, a momentary thing happening in the room. Obviously, you look left and right or you place it in different places and it will reflect different things. So whereas the printed work is a point in time, this is a moving target, but it's the same concept of the paint doing the work, the paint painting itself, the paint making itself. So Kate, we just had a, a question um, uh, from a friend um, who wanted to know about where your sense of color comes from, which is so extraordinary and finely tuned. Is it something that comes from your rigorous education or can you talk a little bit about that? Hmm. It's, it's something I feel in my body. I think that that's really the best way I can describe it. Blah, 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 body. <laughs> <laughs> and also then when it happens, I have a cultural reference that corroborates whatever the, my body is kind of feeling. Well, the next painting is one of the, is a new painting that you made even after the show opened that we brought in a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, this is called Kind Red. This is because there is not a lot of spooky stuff happening in this painting. I just let it be. I let it be me being eight years old, having braids and being just innocent. And the next, and this is the picture that we took flat in order to have like the, the regular view of it. And then the next picture shows how it's activated in my studio, um, which is essential um, to, to what this painting needed to do. But the first one is just showing you the the ingredients of the painting. Do you have a preference on how the painting would be represented? If, if I was going to show this to a person um, to say, this is a marvelous new work of Kate's, how would you want it be, to be presented? It's a great question, but when we did the, the walkthrough, the day we closed the gallery and you were in front of the earth painting, which is no longer in the show, describing it to somebody, it was such a marvelous moment for me to see you reflected in that painting, knowing that, you know, that would never happen again. So I would say as long as it's doing something, that's all that matters to me. And here it's doing a lot. Here it's doing a lot. And you can see that empty space that sanded. That was a breakthrough for me because I wanted that like sense of void, that sense of mystery, emptiness, unknown, with the active sides, which are potentially surrogate paintings or doors or shutters. Obviously, for me, it's a reference to Matisse's Port Fenetra Ouvert because it's an excuse to go into a void. He painted over the street scene after he, before he was done, because he just wanted to focus to the sense of these portals that were opening, even though it was opening it onto a void. That's a really important painting for me. Um, so this is yellow or yellow. Uh, yes. uh, yellow and black, what an old insensitive combination, which is, it's actually dark gray. I just really wanted to do this. I look at a lot of uh, old advertising and I love these, I love these colors together. So the O capitalized is intentional just to acknowledge that this is a very strong combination of values and color. 
but I, I, I love I love these colors together. And you can see on the right side, there's some opening into the yellow, little holes. The reason for that is I was so sad to cover this yellow, which actually took seven coats because I didn't know it was gonna be a transparent color, that I put little interruptions in the, in the dark gray paint so that we would get some of that yellow back on that big shape. That little bit means a lot. And then on the other side, we have our reflected light from the window. Right, right, which will do whatever it wants to do when it goes somewhere else. <clears throat> this painting was kind of like a breakthrough because rather than a portal, they were little shapes. And I, again, like felt that, I felt that in my chest. I just needed there to be an opening of two planes and I didn't know how to substantiate it. So I thought, oh, well, it, they look like eyes and they also look like pockets on my flannel shirt from when I went to camp. So I saw, I think I named this, oh, pocket watch, like it's pockets, but it's also watching. You've made a couple of references to braids, to camp, to childhood. Um, they're not references that I would overtly think are in the, uh, in the paintings. Um, is there a reason they, they've come out or have they always been in? We just have never really talked about it together. Nostal they're almost just like when you think of camp or braids, it's a somewhat nostalgic uh, memory, but nostalgia is not something I think I would ever associate with you. Right. Well, okay, uh, you got that Venn diagram again. And one, <laughs> of the, one of the words is kindness. One of the words is beauty and the ability to be adored. And I think that's the eight-year-old. Beautifully said. So um, this painting, where you see the figure in it, is either it greets you when you come to the gallery, or it says goodbye. Um, and um, uh, it's and really you know, it's said, Mary. I've got to interrupt you. It greets you on the left, and it says goodbye to you on the right. Even though you walk in the gallery and see it first and last, but I wanted to give you this painting so that you could see the bare ingredients of what the rest of the show was made of, and. So, you know, I was embarrassed to make a monochrome like this because I think a lot of different artists have done this, but at a certain point, an artist, i.e. me, I have to allow myself to do a painting that's potentially already been done because I have my own reasons for doing it. And it's a rather large painting. I, I absolutely love it. And it's, um, it just feels like the index painting, the first page of a book, the last page of a book. And maybe that's why it is the shape of a book. Last night you said, we're seen and not seen, hmm. which seems such a profound way to speak about human relations, hmm. you know, as well as something visual. What is invisible to the eye is sometimes is always the key. Um, so I'm happy, I'm really happy we have this, this painting in, in the show and that, as you say, it says hello on one side and goodbye on the other. One thing, um, I think we're going to have, um, uh, be able to pan the gallery they're setting up to, to show us what the gallery is now, but we also have some time for some questions. So, um, from our beloved uh, audience, from everyone who's tuning in, there are questions, you can put them in the Q&A, um, and, or, or uh, you can put them in the chat, depending on how you want to answer your question. So, oops, upside down. John, it's upside down. <laughs> um, still upside down. Now it's sideways. Great. That's perfect. So now we're panning through the gallery so you can have a physical experience of space. There is the painting we were just talking about. And I you want can to see John's see. reflection in that painting. Um, it's a little fuzzy, but I see John. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so he's going to pan through the gallery. And Kate, maybe you could say some of the marvelous titles as he goes by. Oh, 
I don't have anything really interesting to say about this because I think it's so self-explanatory. Okay. Oh, I think the, the only interesting thing about that painting is that there's a violet strip on the left, which I call spaghetti, even though really it looks like linguine, but I thought spaghetti was a funnier word. But definitely not angel hair. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and there's kind red, so you people can get the the activation. It's yeah, interesting because they're quiet in a certain way. You could say they're quiet paintings, but they're also incredibly activated, um, endlessly activated by the viewer and by light. I, I like the way everybody's everybody has their own intellectual take on everything, but I like the way every everybody has their own visual experience as well. I like the painting a lot, particularly we call it eavesdropper, I think, because mm -hmm. at certain angles you do not see the shiny paint on the right side. It just hides because it's the same value as the sanded part. And so it, it's like listening and you don't know it's listening. One, uh, one question for you, Kate, is... Um, oh, uh, oh, is still still painting. We got to talk about that. <laughs> Okay, then I'll, I'll hold the question. Yeah, so here. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Um, the question is from someone, what's emerging? Where is this work taking you? Maybe you can wrap it into discussing this thing. Well, can I just say that this is called the saloon painting. There are so many layers underneath. It's like old jeans. And the reason I called it the saloon painting is that the door, the so-called doors are rather short. Like when you're entering a saloon and it's only your torso that is hidden and you can see the cowboy hat and you can see the boots. So I, I that again, that was like my excuse for making that painting. The title gives the painting an excuse to do what it's doing in, in, a, in a very, in a unique way, I should say. That's a, that's a, um, I've actually, have you ever gone into a saloon like that and seen a cowboy hat in the booths? Oh, I watched, I've only seen it in the movies. <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. It seems like a movie I remember. So. I'm sorry, I forgot the. Um, uh, the question is, what's emerging? Where is this work taking you? I'd love to know. I think I'd like to go back to the lines eventually, but I think the lines cannot be pictorial in the same way they used to be. I'm, I'm, I think that it's going to be a terrific challenge. Um. Yeah, so someone, this is a, a great question. Um, is the role of lines in your work, can you see the questions too, Kate? Or can only I, I no, see I'm them? I'm listening to you. Um, is the role of lines in your work reflective elements in the show? Great question. The The rule of a painting is that it takes you into the panel. It makes some space. So that's what the lines did. Now I'm just making, I'm just asking the paint to do that job. Um, did I answer that? I think so. I think so. I mean, um, the, the question of lines is, um, I think, viewers when they, I mean, someone came in this afternoon and said, oh, where are the lines? And in, in a sense, you know, it's the unspoken question of the people who know Kate and have. Oh, sure. um, there have was seen. always architecture in the lines. The lines always wanted to define, I'm sorry about the lawnmower. There's always uh, the line work wanted to push you back in space in a planar way, or I'm going to put myself on mute while you talk. You talk, Mary. So um, here's a question from um, uh, uh, a beloved friend. Um, you talk about the shape of the painting referencing a book. Um, many paintings seem to be close to squares, which I don't recall historically. You reference Albers. Um, did it, what led to use a square canvas, right? Because it's not really a canvas. Um, and did you find it a challenge to work with this different dimension? Huge challenge. And it had, we had to acknowledge Albers if it was a square and the square was always one inch off of a perfect square, but I had to just dive into Albers if I was going to use a square. I don't know anybody else square. And so the blackboard painting in the middle, mm -hmm. the gray one, is that proportion. Um, 
this one is not this proportion. So John, go in the middle to the gray, gray, gray painting. Um, that is that very difficult proportion. And I needed to, if you go closer, you can see that there's two planes. One is pushing you back and the other one is on the side. Um, it, it's like a, a swinging door. Um, so that was another way to deal with that, um, to deal with that so-called problem. And yeah, if it doesn't address the body, a drawing of the body or a reflection of the body, I hope you can hear me, then it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an idea in your mind. And if it's an idea in your mind, then it, it gets to be a square. Uh, this is a question about how your work lives in people's homes. Um, is there ever a reflection that feels wrong for you when you've seen a painting at, at someone's home? Do you prefer natural light in a private environment or any, you know, environment that you prefer strongly or um, dislike? If a painting is facing a light source, that's the most aggressive form of interaction it can have. My friend Chris has a big red painting that used to be a right in front of a window and he said kate what do i do and i said let the painting do what it does and enjoy, enjoy looking at the line work at night that was the, that was the best answer i could give but i think it's really up to the person who owns the painting about what that painting should be doing in their house that's very generous um we have a lot of questions now, Kate, so hopefully we're going to get through them. They keep coming in. I'm happy, um, I'm happy as long as... Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if I should say people's names or not, though they're identified. Um, maybe someone could put in the chat um, whether they would like me to say their name or not. Um, so one person asked, is fact rather than fiction a crucial part of your work? I would say that one of the criteria is that you can name elements in the work with words. You can say that you feel something happening that is that can be related to, to words. So it is a fiction, but I'd, I'd like you to hold on to something. I don't want to leave you empty handed. Um, someone asks, or they recall that you painted classical portraits and I remember an extraordinary drawing you did. <laughs> it's not from your mom. No, it's not from your mom. Um, how do you look back on these classical portraits now and do you very, still do them? Very fondly. Um, I did them for a living for a while. It was an incredible experience and Colby Chamberlain, did I get that right? I'm very nervous, um, wrote about them and about how I used to eliminate after a while the features. I could no longer be paid for them and that I always want a sense of presence in the work. Mm -hmm. So while it's not a face and hair and eyes, I just want you to get a sense that somebody is home. That's an expression I use in the studio a lot. I say, nobody's home in that painting and then I'll get rid of it. Uh, the expression you used last night about the table was great. There's yeah. nothing missing. My grandmother used to say when she looked at a table full of food, there's nothing here that's missing. And I think about that when I, sh when I make a painting that's particularly spare. Is there anything here that's missing? Or can I say there's nothing here that's missing? It's beautiful. So a colleague in the gallery says to me, says to you, this is your, this seems to me your best body of work. It also seems to be the closest to sculpture in the way you're connecting the audience to the painting. It's the 3D-ness of it all. Do you feel this? And people might not know that you make sculpture. I, I feel like it's like amateur kinetic sculpture or it's like 2D kinetic sculpture. So it's not like a George Rickey, but it is a George Rickey because it, it gets to make its own George Rickey. I hope I got that name right. Um, it, it is, it's inherently sculptural because the room is playing a role in the painting and the room is the sculpture in the painting. Well, um, we've come to the end of our question. Oh, wait, there's one more question though. I think you did answer it in the, in the talk. 
someone wanted to know about your materials. The only, I use house paint only. Mm -hmm. Hard, hardware store is my art supply store. And the only oil paint I would ever use is in the line work with a very, very, very fine brush. I use um, like a broken white so that it doesn't look too stark, but that it looks like light, but it doesn't look like white paint. And um, so those are the two materials that I use. I, let's have another question. This is fun. Um, I'm wait, we are waiting for a question. Someone could, well, Igor's question was so complex. It was three questions, but anyway. Oh, hi, Igor. Um, so, uh, okay. Do you have a question, Kate, that you want to ask? I want to know what Igor is asking. Uh, Igor asked the question about the shape and Alpers. Oh, you mean in the television painting? Yeah. I had to offset the square. Albers is symmetrical left and right and, and left, right and bottom and then heavy on top. I had to offset the square so that there was a sense of like movement and, um, and um, like there was a directionality of where you could feel like it was looking at as opposed to just a, a, like a center tunnel. I wanted the tunnel to come from the side if that's a, if that's a, a good answer. It is. Um, so someone asks, how is it for you working in the pandemic and what changed for you, if anything? It was a really convenient time for me to not work. I'm working now on watercolors of flowers, which is incredibly fun and challenging because um, the more conventionally I do it, the worse it gets. Um, but I add this beautiful medium into the paint, which gives it a graininess. It almost looks like there's dirt in the paint and it has gravity, so it flows down. Um, and I also had to copy a painting during the pandemic, which was really satisfying because it felt like going to work. So for months I was taking the subway every day before people were really taking the subway a lot. And I, I, I loved having that sense of purpose. I did the show in Houston of the show that could be seen just from the lawn. And um, so I did that from afar via text, sending dimensions so that Josh at the gallery could make the painting. I, I feel like there needs to be a sense of gamesmanship when there's, a, when there's um, any constraints. It's just time to play a new game, to just to keep the ball in the air. Yeah, the, the, uh, you had sent us all the work for the show, so um, the studio was kind of empty. So now all of a sudden we have a flood of questions. We have five minutes left, so we'll try to get to a few of them. Um, I'm gonna combine two. Um, someone is asking who are the artists, living artists, who um, you relate to and how separately another person asks if you relate to artists in the light, to the light and space artists in particular, like James Terrell, Robert Irwin, Mary Course, which I don't think we've ever talked about those artists together. No, um, this is the hardest question of all of them. Yes. Period. Um, is Velasquez still alive? I'm sorry? Is Velasquez still alive or? <laughs> I like him. Um, I would really have to give that a lot of thought. I have so many amazing peers with whom I like to talk and I love visiting their studio and we're all fabricating things from different angles and love each other for different ways. And I would say that I feel, I feel pretty alone in what I'm doing. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm in a camp. So it's hard for me to say this because who my who I'm influenced by because um, yeah I feel pretty alone and I'm happy for that but also I doubt myself like what am I doing here but it feels really true to me too. It is true. I mean, truth is Kate. Truth and Kate are exact um, uh, definitions. <laughs> um, 
So this is a little more uh, easy question. Um, one person wants to know, as you prepared uh, or ordered your panels for the show, how did you determine the shape and scale? And were you already thinking about how the show would lay out um, and when you were making the, the paintings? I don't like, thank you for the question. I don't like to think about installation because I think that each, sorry about the noise, each, each painting is a, a unique, it has to succeed on its own terms, but the 52 by 44, whatever, for a while, that was the biggest that the screen painter, screen, screen uh, that the printer could actually print. So mm -hmm. we were constrained by dimensions. Mm -hmm. and, and yet it felt quite right because it was in between a door and a window and it wasn't addressing the whole body, but it was, you know, addressing some sort of openness that could take place um, and and that void so um, that was the most common shape in the show um, and and also the other thing that I would do is if I felt really confident about a painting I would hurry up to make to make an order of the panel the same size because I would have confidence that I was able to understand what that space could do in that shape but you weren't making paintings saying oh this is going to go here or this because you know the space you've done so many shows you've done so many shows here um but you weren't thinking of spaces for uh, of paintings for specific locations in the gallery to tell you the truth this is the hardest show we have ever done without a doubt because the subject the the technique was so different that we didn't know how to present it to people who knew my work because how would they even make sense of it? So a lot of the presentation had to do with introducing an idea. So the car wash painting that I showed in this presentation couldn't make the cut in the gallery because it was like two steps removed from the initial idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say what a puzzle that was, really hard. Um, someone just sent, I, it's not really a question, it's a meditation, which I think it's a beautiful thing to end, end on, where the person talks about presence and absence. Yes. And the image of the pond and the image of the gallery. So both, let's say, nature and the big, and the, and the interior, let's say, gallery or museum space, where we can't yet wander into museums and we're all dreaming about, I think, both museums and nature. So Kate, you know, you are an artist who has always been in presence and absence and seen and unseen. And while I'm very sorry that your show didn't have the fullest audience that it could, somehow I feel it's the most important show we could have done during this time and Thanks. that it nourished people mm -hmm. in the way that they could discover it in whatever means. So thank you for the exhibition and thank you to everyone who's been uh, listening and sending yeah, these thoughtful like questions. Three more days or four more days? Some more days. Make an appointment. And even if you don't make an appointment, you know, we'll let you in. Knock, knock hard. Just knock. We have a doorbell now. We have an expensively installed installed doorbell that I don't really know how to use. Save you can just save on calling, right. So thank you all and thank you to Grace and thank you to John who set this up and thank you to Liz who midwifed the show. Yes. So Boy. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the gallery the long team. Bye-bye. Bye for everybody. Bye. Bye to everybody. <laughs>